So once again, welcome. Today's lesson is going to be on myths and disinformation and how you can identify it, what makes people fall for it, and what you can do. So I'm Brittany Norwood. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a Commons librarian here at Hodges Library. So if you ever come up to the public services desk or you use research assistance, I might be with a person who ends up helping you out. And my email address is norwoodbr at utk.edu. Hello there. I am Sarah Johnson. I use she, her, hers pronouns as well. And I'm also a Commons librarian. So um, yeah, like Brittany said, jack of all trades, we do a little bit of everything. Um, and please feel free to contact either of us um, if you have any questions about anything. We're librarians. <laughs> Okay. Is that the right slide? Yeah, it's not. Oh, there we go. Huh. Give me one second to see what's going on with my screen. <laughs> yeah, for some reason it skipped over your slide, Sarah. But <laughs> now we are back to it. I mean, I guess that's par for the course with uh, how life goes these days. Anywho, okay, so this image that you see here, um, apparently government organizations have to put into writing that mermaids are not real. Um, why, might you ask? Yes, information. Yep, that's what we're gonna be talking about today or part of it, partly. Um, so this image here is actually from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, which is a fairly trusted, you know, nonpartisan organization. And they created this post and please know that it was updated March of this year. Um, but they created this post to address the, the many questions they were getting about mermaids being real. And Brittany's going to talk about a little bit why that might be the case. Yeah, so you might be wondering why so many people were asking the NOAA, why are mermaids, are mermaids real? Well, several sources state that this influx of questioning came about following the Discovery Channel and Animal Planet screenings of mermaids the body found. So here is one of the title cards for this film. This was aired in 2012 and it was a fake documentary. And in a piece affirming that this was supposed to be fiction, um, the Today Show quoted the mockumentary's press release claims that the film is science fiction using science as a springboard into the imagination. Now that might seem in a, in a, in a sense enough. Several artists utilize innovative and experimental methods to create revolutionary pieces. The problem was, Mermaids wasn't marketed as science fiction. Viewers weren't made aware that the so-called scientists were just actors and that the so-called science was actually based on highly controversial and an overall discredited hypothesis. Furthermore, several sources say that there wasn't even a mention that this film was fake until the brief title card aired after the documentary itself had finished. So when you combine all of this information with the fact that this documentary aired on channels that had a good reputation for disseminating science in an accessible manner, you ended up with a perfect storm. But Discovery didn't just stop after the backlash from this film. Here's that they had identified the market for conspiracy theories was profitable and that they could just claim artistic license when members of the scientific community balked. They continued making more films similar to Mermaids with some even more steeped in disinformation. A perfect example of this was their film Megalodon, the monster shark that lives. While credible scientists were appalled by the pseudoscience presented that claimed the Megalodon might still exist, and they did everything in their power to disseminate the information needed to prove that it couldn't possibly still be alive, those associated with the film responded by saying, quote, since a contemporary Megalodon cannot be disproven, the jury is out on its continued existence, end quote. So essentially they were claiming that since you can't not find one, you can't say it doesn't exist. 
So the reasons why this is so troubling are that these fake documentaries were presented as true. And this is best said by Tyler and Schiffman, who said these fake documentaries followed a very particular style, weaving real science, natural history, and current events with fabricated images, CGI video, and interviews with actors playing experts, witnesses, and government officials. In each case, the fake documentaries created conflict by inserting real government agencies into narratives as antagonists and implicated working scientists in fictional conspiracies. In fact, this process was so effective that a Time Magazine poll that was um, went live after the Megalodon um, docu fake documentary screening showed that 79% of people who watched this film thought the Megalodon was still alive and only 27 percent of watchers said, quote, they thought the shark was extinct and that the scientists are right. So these so-called documentaries were a masterclass in disinformation and conspiracy theories and are a perfect example of why the topics we're covering today are important. And that leads us into what we will be covering today. So we're gonna be going over the different types of myths and disinformation, why we're fooled by this information, how we can identify this, different resources that you could use to help you out throughout this process, and what you can do to help stop the spread of myths and disinformation. So I know a lot of what makes this topic so intimidating is the jargon. So I'm gonna take a few minutes to explain it a bit more fully. The three terms you're gonna hear most often are misinformation, disinformation, and conspiracy theories. So misinformation is untrue information that is circulated by a source that believes it to be true. Disinformation is untrue information circulated by a source that knows the information is untrue. Now you might be wondering why just that distinction is important. It's just semantic, right? Well, not really. Think about it like this. Misinformation is the person who is lying to you, but they're not aware that they're lying. Disinformation is the person who's lying to you and knows exactly what they're doing. And now we can say a lot about the argument surrounding intent and impact, and ultimately myths and disinformation can have the same impact. But we'd also need to account for the fact that anyone can be the person spreading misinformation, realize that they were wrong, and be an adult and responsible and mature and address that they made a mistake. But the person who's intentionally lying to me, well, that's someone I'm not gonna trust in the future. And then we have conspiracy theories. Now, conspiracy theories differ a bit from the other two as this is more about a pattern of belief. And they are heavily rooted in the myths and disinformation landscape as they grow and build from the sharing of information that isn't true or is improperly presented. However, they're really big and different enough to warrant their own lesson. So let us know after this session if you would like maybe to see a part two focusing on conspiracy theories next semester. In the meantime, let's look at some of the information or some more information um, about specific types of mis- and disinformation. So here's some specialized terminology. First, there's imposter content, which occurs when another source of information is faked. So this could be like something like someone impersonating a celebrity's social media account, or it could be as extreme as someone faking an entire issue of the Washington Post and freely distributing several copies of the fake which is a thing that really happened on May 1st of 2019. For more information on that story, I have a link that I'm gonna have Elijah put in the chat in case you are wondering how that came about and why people did this. But yeah, it is a thing that happened. It costed the people who made it a lot of money and the Wall Street Journal, or the Washington Post had to go into damage control mode really fast and release the actual image of the paper that they had ran that day. This leads into false context, which is what happens when real information is presented without the proper context. So this could be like what happens when somebody takes a soundbite of a person saying something and they make it sound like they are meaning something completely different. In a similar vein, there's misleading content, which is the misleading use of information often to villainize an idea or, or a person. There's false connection, which is essentially the technical term for clickbait. There's manipulated content, which is when real information is altered with the intention of misrepresenting it. And there's fabricated content, 
which is what happens when new content that is completely false is created. And this isn't just news or text-based sources either. You can have things like computer-generated imagery, um, deep fakes, so on. Then there is fake news, which is what happens when any of these misleading terms or misrepresented information or fabricated content is presented as actual news. And then there are some um, terms for myth or disinformation that is used in um, the scientific fields. So once again, going back to Thaler and Schiffman, which is um, another link I'm gonna have Elijah put out that way that you can reference it if you'd like. Um, they have bad science, which defines, which they defined as unsound conclusions drawn from valid premises. There's pseudoscience, which they say are sound conclusions drawn from invalid premises. And then there's fake science, which they define as unsound conclusions drawn from invalid premises. So yes, this does mean that even if you're looking at something that's supposed to be scholarly or peer reviewed, you still need to look at it critically because even that can be fallible. So now let's talk about why we fall for mis or disinformation. Well, it often speaks to something inside of us that wants to believe in things. There is something in it that is convincing to us. Perhaps it's because of how it's presented. Mis or disinformation can look like a reputable source. We might hear mis or disinformation from a person we trust, like a parent, a religious leader, a mentor. And we are more likely to believe that information if it comes from one of those people. We might believe in mis or dis disinformation because it reaffirms something that we already believe in. So we don't wanna to look too closely at it because that might mean that we have to actually think about our arguments a little bit more difficult and look at things more hardly, except that we might be wrong. And we might be more likely to believe in mis or disinformation if it elicits a strong emotion, particularly if that's a negative emotion, as our critical thinking skills are going to be impaired in that situation. And finally, there are some people who really do seem to be more likely to believe in mis or disinformation and conspiracy theories in particular than other people. This often has to do with the way our brain processes belief systems. And it has been found that people who are more superstitious or who already believe in one conspiracy theory are the people who are more likely to believe in other conspiracy theories. But what we really need to know now is how do we identify this sort of information so we don't fall for it anymore. So first of all, there are a couple of skills you're gonna to wanna to use. Initially, you wanna make sure that you're approaching any piece of information with the intent of engaging in critical thinking. So yes, this means that even if you even do this with information that your family or your mentors share with you, people should always be willing to support their beliefs with proper information, citations, references. Um, now, this doesn't mean that in that moment that they might ha have all the answers and they might need some time to look things back up, share sources with you, so on and so forth. But remember that you can also do that yourself. You can check out information that these people are telling you on your own. Make sure that it's right. And ultimately, critical thinking is key when it comes to identifying this and disinformation. Always make sure you're approaching any claim with the intention of gathering more information to see if you can back it up. So keep a healthy dose of skepticism. And I'm not telling you to always be cynical, but being cautious or at times cautiously optimistic until you, haven't, until you feel like the information has been verified is a good move. You're also going to want to engage in laudable reading. So aside from critical thinking, this is the most powerful weapon in your arsenal. Lateral reading means getting off the page or the website that you're looking at and checking it against other sources. So if you were looking at something in the New York Times, you would wanna to go to other newspapers to double check that information. And this also means more than just basic fact checking. It can mean investigating the company or the author or the site's publisher, as well as searching for you know, these different people, maybe in Google and seeing what other sources have to say. Now, lateral reading differs from some of the basic information credibility testing that used to be pretty effective. In the past, you could look for context clues on the website itself to see if it was the type of source you should be trusting. I mean, we've all seen older websites that um, look really sketchy and you know, we know immediately, maybe I should look somewhere else. But now 
even these sources that are telling you complete and other lies can look extremely professional. So that's why you're going to need to get off the page to look at other sources, see what they have to say about this information to know that this is something you need to be trusting. So try to find as much of a consensus as possible across several reliable sources. Check that the sources are citing sources, if they're citing anything at all, and see if those sources look real, credible, and pertain to and support what the site has said. Check the author to see what their biases are and if they might have been influenced by external factors like funding from a larger corporation. Check to see if the website itself is known to be filled with satire or is a known spreader of mis or disinformation. Next, you also need to use click restraint. And this means resisting the urge to just select the first option that a search engine gives you. Actually look through your result list to see what sources might be the most helpful and go to the next page if not appear trustworthy or relevant to you. And if you aren't having any luck finding anything, try switching up your keywords, but don't just use the first thing Google throws at you because it's easy to do that. If there's an image involved in what you're trying to double check, this is a case in which you can often still analyze it using context clues. If someone is claiming that a photo took place in Knoxville in the summer, look to see if there are any landmarks you recognize. So, you know, if that picture has like the Eiffel Tower, the Statue of Liberty in it, um, they are misrepresenting the image that did not happen in Knoxville. But even if you notice something like West Town Mall, look at other context clues. If there's three feet of snow in this picture of Knoxville and it's supposed to be in the summer, the timeline's probably wrong. If everyone's just driving cars that look 10 years out of date and the fashion is similarly dated, then there's a good chance that this is a really old image being construed as something new. And if you don't recognize any landmarks, look for other factors. So say you're being um, told that an image of a city um, is from a city that has a desert climate. Look to see if actually the surrounding area looks like it's a desert climate. It could also be useful to you know, check the street names to see what language they're written in or if there's anything that you automatically recognize. But remember that can get murky um, based on you know, whether or not this is an area that is presenting their street signs in a language outside of what is um, going on in the larger area. You might also wanna use a reverse image search or geolocation to check the veracity of an image or to see where an image actually comes from. So here's an example of this. Um, I use Google Chrome to do this. And if you look up how to reverse image search, then it'll tell you what browsers will work for you. Um, I was on wish.com. I looked up strawberry dress and I found this. And as somebody who knows a lot about fashion, I automatically knew what website this is from. This is a Lyrica Matashi dress that wish.com was trying to pass off as their own. When I right clicked on the image, I went down to search Google for image and that brought me up the research result, the reverse image search. And sure enough, the first link was the link to the Lyrica Matashi website. And you can do this with more than just items. You can do this with places. So you can see if the image might've actually occurred in Knoxville and so on and so forth. And while all of these skills are great, remember that you're also gonna to need to work on your mindset. Misinformation so often works because it makes people emotional. It does play with that clickbait sort of mentality, outraging you or upsetting you enough that you stop questioning things. You can't do that. Keep a level head, even if that means stepping away from your device for a while until you can calm down enough to think things through clearly and rationally. Also make sure that you're aware of your own biases. This or disinformation exists across sociocultural boundaries. And if there's a topic that you're passionate about or an issue that's is presented in terms of sides, there's almost certainly mis or disinformation being presented across that entire spectrum of beliefs. And the closer the mis or disinformation is to your own biases, the more likely you are to fall for it. So it's important to know these things about yourself and to be aware of how you're taking in information because mis or disinformation is constructed in a way that can make you believe outrageous things. I mean, just think about the example we started off with. Not many people might've been convinced about mermaids existing off the bad science alone, that when the mockumentary decided to frame things as a cover up of government organizations, people who were already suspicious of government organizations for you know, rational reasons, suddenly were presented with something that fed into their fears and made them start believing in something totally irrational. And 
now that we've spoken about skills and mindsets, let's take let's look at some helpful tools and resources. Yeah, so using some of those skills and uh, keeping the mindset as Brittany talked about, these, what some of the resources that we have, like a really great one is a research guide um, and it's information and media literacy. And I'm gonna talk about two specific resources that are inside the research guide that I think are gonna be really helpful. Um, the first one here, is you know evaluating resources using the radar approach um evaluating sources is going to be you know critical in a lot of or all classes in college and you know it can go long into your lifespan um so you know having this handy in your back pocket is a great idea um so radar stands for relevance authority date appearance and reason for writing so relevance is you know is this information relevant to your assignment or what you're researching authority is going to be who is the author you know what tells you that they are authority authoritative on the topic that they're writing about date when was this information published? And, you know, is that important to your research? Appearance is, you know, what clues can you get from the appearance of the actual source? Um, does it have citations or references, that kind of thing? And, you know, reason for writing is gonna be, you know, why did this writer publish this information? Um, and that can be, that can go a, a bunch of different ways. Um, and so the article that's linked here goes more in depth into the kinds of questions that you can ask yourself using this approach, but that's kind of the, the general basics. The second one is just good for anyone because we live in the information age and being able to spot fake news is um, pretty helpful uh, right now. So some of the tips um, it offers and spotting fake news are um, like considering the source, you know, take a look at that information that's coming from, or it, that is coming from, uh, gosh, take that information and look at it because there are a lot of like fake news sources out there. So you want to make sure that the source is, you know, credible. Um, read beyond the headline because like that's not going to tell you everything. Um, they can be real inviting though. Um, check the author again, you know, who is this person? <laughs> What's the support? Can you find evidence elsewhere that's supporting what they're saying? And, you know, like real evidence. Um, but like that's kind of the general consensus of, or general skills listed in this article about how to spot fake news um and that one also goes way more, like that those are only a few that like just touches the surface that article's got some really good other tips um on how to do that thank you for that sarah now i'm going to really quickly go over you know what you can do to help stop the spread of mis and disinformation so you might be wondering what you can do moving forward it can be a bit scary out there, especially if you feel like you have these tools and you're living in a world with people who don't and um, you don't know how to help the situation out. I know that because I've been there myself. And first of all, just know like your limits. There's some things you can't do. You can't force a person to believe in facts or reason or science as much as you might want to. But there are some like small things you can do that can really make things better and impact things. First of all, make sure that you're always checking your own sources, especially if you're planning on sharing that information with others. If you want to stop the spread, like you have to practice what you preach. Second of all, don't share something that you know is mis disinformation, even if you're just doing it as a joke. And that brings us to this image that I thought was pretty obviously fake. Um, once during a class, I was exposed to something called the Pacific Northwest tree octopus. And I knew it was a fake right off the bat, 
I thought it was hilarious and had a funny story attached to it. So I sent this information to my mom. She suddenly became an extreme advocate for the poor Northwest tree octopus and believed extremely fully in its plight. There's your lesson. Just because you know it's a fake, it doesn't mean that your loved ones will. Once again, remember to stay calm. One of the main reasons why people start to get dug into misinformation when they're confronted with the fact that they've fallen victim to it is that they get defensive. They think that they're being called stupid and they don't wanna to listen to you because of that. Nobody wants to listen to the person who's calling them stupid. So make sure you're not bringing that energy. If you have the space and the privilege, approach the situation with care and sympathy. Remember, this could just as easily be you and think about how you would best react if the shoe was on the other foot. Next, teach your loved ones some basic skills. After the tree octopus debacle, I knew I needed to teach my mom some of these, some of the stuff I've touched on in this presentation, like checking multiple sources and knowing how to keep your cool when you're presented with a topic that you're passionate about. It was a bit of an uncomfortable conversation to start off with her, but ultimately I wanted her to feel safe and in control. So I extended that invitation. And now she feels really confident when she looks through the news and different websites and she's not getting fooled anymore by tree octopi. Finally, learn to admit when you're wrong. Once again, we can all fall victim to mis or disinformation. So we're all capable of spreading it. If that happens to you, don't dig in or get defensive as much as you might want to. If this is something that you've posted and shared with other people, don't just delete the post and act like nothing happened. Admit your error, provide the correct information, and some reliable sources, and then move forward as appropriate, which could then mean deleting the post or making it private. But you wanna make sure that you actually address the misinformation first. Be the example that we need in this landscape so that others can see your integrity and learn from it. And remember, once again, we're all human beings. None of us are infallible, but these small things can really help us create a better information climate moving forward. Okay. And that is the end of this session. We can stop the recording now. Um, please feel, um, please.